Our scripture reading this morning, uh, once again, is drawn from the 23rd Psalm. Here, these beautiful words taken from the New King James translation of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Let, me, let us uh, join just in a brief word of prayer before we begin our message this morning. Father, we pray that you will take these, the words of my mouth and the meditations that are upon all of our hearts and minds. Mold, shape them, Lord, make them pleasing in your sight. Draw us in the direction that your spirit is leading. We might hear what you have to say to the church and have our lives transformed as you work within us. All to your glory, through Christ we pray. Amen. About a year ago, my wife and I were uh, planning to move uh, here. The bishop had appointed us, announced he had appointed us here at Sharonville as uh, your new pastor. And uh, we were trying to sell the house we were living in. The church we were at before uh, did not have a church-owned parsonage. We had been given a housing allowance. And I was having a love, about this time, I was having a love-hate relationship with uh, HGTV with HGTV. We had had countless people, we probably, we estimated somewhere between probably 40 and 50 people had visited our house and had looked at it and repeatedly we kept getting notes, little messages, emails from the uh, real estate agents. Well, you know, they, they thought that the, the the countertops in the kitchen needed to really be upgraded, that uh, there was no stainless steel appliances uh, in, in the kitchen area. The washer and dryer looked a little bit dated, you know. Uh, are you sure that that basement had never had any water in it? Uh, you know, just one pit nitpicky little thing after another that just let us know that HGTV was alive and well and people were expecting a certain level of uh, quality quality um, and that was just was they just weren't finding it in our house and, and so these heroes of HGTV became the culprits uh, the people that I vented my frustration on the property brothers what did they think that they were doing you know who did they think they were you know well, that just led us into, that leads us into the whole idea of rehab. This morning, as we continue our ongoing series that we've been looking at, uh, taken from the uh, 23rd Psalm, where we're calling it uh, a psalm in the key of life as it addresses a number of uh, very important life issues. This morning, we're going to delve into just that sentence in verse 3, he restores my soul. The soul, which is that most important inner part of us, that part of us that relates to God, that part of us that, that really is who we are at the very core and essence of our being. The soul can grow in disrepair. And this morning we're going to look at three in particular circumstances, three situations that have a tendency of, of denigrating our soul. And that the Bible assures us that, that God has an answer, that God can restore the soul, when it's overcome by these three situations, we're going to talk about guilt, we're going to talk about grief, and we're going to talk about grudges this morning. Guilt, grief. It's easy to remember that, is it? Guilt. Say it with me. Guilt, grief, and grudges. They've already heard the sermon before. Matter of fact, several of them could just stand up here and not. <laughs> <laughs> guilt, greed, and grudges. This morning, the first one we're going to look at is guilt. How does the Lord restore? Let God remove your guilt. How does God work to restore our guilt? The psalmist said in Psalm 38, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. All of us uh, have opportunities, have moments at times in our lives where we are overcome. We are burdened by guilt. 
You know, we are, we are finite creatures. We are not perfect. We're, I'm only human, we say. But we are. And because of that, we do sin. We do debt transgress. We do fall short of God's glory. And what do we do with that burden of guilt that we're carrying around? Well, there's a lot of things that people try to do to assuage that guilt. Well, we try to deny it. We try to shove it down. We try to bury it. But you know, every time you throw the cat out the window, he comes around the front door and scratches and wants to get back in again. We just, it just, guilt just keeps getting resurrected no matter how deep we try to bear it. We try to minimize it. We try to say things like, well, everybody else is doing it. It really wasn't that serious a thing. If it wasn't that serious, then why are you still remembering it? You know, for goodness sake, you have a hard enough time remembering your grandchildren's names let alone their birth dates. But guilt, just, it just can't escape us, won't escape our memory. We can, we can compromise, we can rationalize it, we can lower our standards, we can blame other people. That's what Adam did. It was that woman that you gave me. It was her fault. If they hadn't uh, talked me into it, if they hadn't led me astray, if they hadn't done it first, I wouldn't have joined them. We can beat ourselves up. We do all kinds of things to try to make guilt disappear, but it just won't go away. But the Bible says that God has an answer to our guilt, that God can remove our guilt and its solution is found in the message of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are justified. We are treated by God just as if I'd never sinned. We're justified by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Redemption means to pay for something, to pay the price, to pay the penalty, to redeem it, to pay the bill. You know, when you have a bill and you're, you're not sure you got enough money, you kind of worry about how am I going to be able to pay that bill when it comes due? You go to the doctor and you got this huge deductible and you say, how in the world am I going to pay that? My insurance isn't going to cover that. But when you finally manage to pay it and that, you get that big red stamp that says, boom, paid in full. When you click that button on your computer and that money is flying out of your account, it flies very fast, faster than the speed of sound, uh, for out of your, your account into their account. But you know that it has been paid in full. There's no worrying about that bill anymore, is there? When God stamps paid in full on the bill of lading of our sin and says, in Christ, you're forgiven. There is no need for us to be concerned. God offers us his grace, his forgiveness to remove the burden of guilt that we carry in our lives. The second area we've talked about, we've mentioned, is uh, grief. Grief is any kind of loss that we have in our life. And grief comes in many shapes and forms. You know, it's, it's not just, it, it is one of the biggest sources of grief, of course, is the loss of someone we love. A spouse, a parent, a child, a brother, sister, a co-worker, someone important to us. Of course, that brings an overwhelming sense of guilt. But there can be other things that bring grief into our lives as well. You know, the grief of the loss of a job, the grief of, loss, the grief of a loss of, of income, the grief that comes from lost opportunities, the grief that comes from loss of hopes and ex expectations and anticipations about life, the grief that comes because your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter didn't turn out as well as you were hoping they'd be. They didn't get into that school, that college you wanted them to be a part of. Loss can come in many shapes and forms. The loss of a pet, a beloved pet. David grieved because of a loss of a, of a child in his life. The child that has, was born to he and Bathsheba out of the sinful relationship that they were caught up in. D David did a few things to help him in his grief that we can do as well. First of all, David didn't look back and say, what if, 
What if it had turned out different? What if it had turned out better? He looked back and he said, you know what? I can't do anything about that. The child had died, and as long as the child was still alive, David fasted, David prayed. But when the child died, the Bible says he washed his face and he ate some food. He said, I can't do anything about that. I can't alter the past. I can't resurrect that thing that was lost. And so I'll accept what cannot be changed. I'll accept what cannot be changed. That death that has occurred, that event that never happened, that opportunity that was lost, I'll just have to accept the fact that it's gone. But David prayed. He prayed and he asked for God's help. He played down his loss and he prayed up God's ability to help. Many times when we find ourselves thrust into grief, especially the grief that comes from the loss of someone we love, we use strong, extreme words like never and always and impossible. I'll never feel like a whole person again. I'll always feel this badly. It'll be impossible. It's impossible for me to go on with life alone. When we ought to be saying things like, God will never abandon me. God is always near to those who have a broken heart. With God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. Play down the foreverness and the grandioseness of the loss and play up the greatness of God's ability to sustain us in the midst of that loss and to overcome that loss. Bill Hybels from the uh, uh, Willow Creek Church in uh, North Barrington, Chicago, just outside of Chicago, says you can either look at the mountain or you can look at God. You can say, look how big this mountain is, or we can say, look how big my God is. The one who can move the mountains. Play down the loss and pray up God's ability to intervene and, and act in our life. And finally, focus on what's left, not what has been lost. Focus on what's left. David didn't say, well, Bathsheba, that's it. Life's over. The hopes are gone. No. The Bible said he lay with his wife. She became pregnant and gave birth to another child. Another little boy whom they gave the name Solomon. Who became one of the mighty kings of Israel. Who became one of the wisest men that ever walked upon the face of the earth. Focus upon what you still have available. What opportunities are still there. What new opportunities. What new joys. What new adventures. What new ways God will continue to work and meet your needs in your life. Let God remove your grief with his consolation and with his comfort and with his grace. Finally, the third area that oftentimes destroys the human soul is the grudges that we have in life. When someone else has hurt us, when someone has done something that is a grave offense against us, and we're carrying that around, and there is that humanness inside of us that says, I want to strike back, I want to lash back, I want to get even with that person. No matter who we are in the world, as long as we're human, as long as we interact with other people, we're going to be hurt. People are going to unintentionally and people are going to intentionally do things that hurt us. Some slides and some overlooks are going to be deliberate and some are going to be accidental. And for goodness sake, I, I'm thankful for uh, Jackson's grace this morning. I forgot the benediction response at the first service. I was out the door, I was shaking hands, and all of a sudden I heard these voices, and I thought, <gasps> but he was gracious. He was gracious. Instead of holding a grudge, let God remove our grudges. Well, how, you say, well, how in the world 
can I possibly forgive? How do I do that? My wife has led on a couple of different occasions a study uh, of a book called What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. And in it, he quotes, a f- this is going to get a little complicated, he quotes Leonard Schmieds. Leonard Schmieds was a longtime professor of uh, ethics at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary out in California. And uh, forgiveness was one of his main interests. How do human beings forgive one another? And he says there's three keys to forgiving. There's three keys to letting go of grudges. He says the first is we have to surrender our right to get even. Forgiveness always costs. It costs God something. It costs him the, the life of his son. God could have you know, zapped us and struck us down. But God gave up that right when he offered forgiveness to us in Jesus Christ. Surrender the right to get mad and to get even and be willing to bear the embarrassment, the pain of the hurt. Surrender the right to get even. Secondly, Smead says we need to rediscover the humanity of that other person. Rediscover the humanity of that other person. You know, there's there's people that have done something perhaps to you. And from that point on, in your mind, they're always that person who... They're identified with their misdeed. Oh, here comes Mr. Busybody. Here comes Miss Gossip. Here comes Mr. I Know It All. Here comes I'm more important than you are. They become affiliated and associated in our minds with their misdeed, not with who they are. Speed says we've got to remember, just like us, they're a human being. They are a finite, fallen human being, and if we're going to remove, have God remove our grudges, we need to be reconsidering that they're just human also. And perhaps they're just as, feeling just as guilty as we might have felt, or they're just as desirous of some kind of healing and restoration to take. We rediscover that this is a human being. This is not a problem or a pain standing before me. And thirdly, Smeed says the last step, the last hurdle we've got to get over is to begin to wish that person well in life. Wish that person. Now, my daughter-in-law, God bless her. No, I love her. Uh, But that's a phrase that she uses. You know, she wants to talk about somebody. It's not gossip. No, no, nothing like that. But she... You know, you know, Mary, God bless her. You know. No, really, God bless them. Not only are they a human being, but I desire good in their life. Not that they be struck down and destroyed, have their teeth kicked in and their head dashed against a stone. That's another part of the Psalms. But if God is going to empower us to remove our grudges, then we need to begin praying for God's blessing on that person's life. It's a redemptive process. It takes time. We may never forget what's been done. We may or may not be reconciled to that person. But God can empower us through his grace to forgive Paul said, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every kind of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as Christ, as in Christ, God forgave you. Corey Ten Boom was a uh, world-renowned Christian in the 60s, 70s, perhaps in early 80s. She was a child, was a teenager in Holland during Second World War. Her and her family, because of their Christian convictions, housed escaped Jews until they were caught 
They were shipped off to a German concentration camp. She was in prison with her sister Betsy, her older sister Betsy, and in time they were abused by the prison guards, verbally, physically, mentally abused, mistreated. Betsy eventually died uh, of her uh, abuses, uh, lack of nourishment, lack of health care, and so forth. But after the war was over, Corey uh, made it her business uh, out of her Christian convictions to go around Europe and preach the, the message of forgiveness, of God's ability in Christ to forgive us, and of the reconciliation and the healing that can happen between human beings through the same grace of God. One night she was in uh, Munich, Germany speaking, and when the service was over, she was standing at the head of the, of the aisle at the front, greeting people and she looked up and she saw this man walking down the aisle in her direction and suddenly she realized where she'd seen that face before he was one of the prison guards that had been in charge of her and her sister and as he got closer he says Fraulein he says I really appreciate your message this evening about the forgiveness of God it has been so true in my life there was so much God needed to forgive me of I thank you that I can know God's forgiveness and reconciliation and he held out his hand and she said there was no way that I could shake that hand she said it was like it was paralyzed and I instantaneously prayed dear God forgive me I can't forgive this man and she said, I found something happening, and my hand was raising, and I shook his hand. And in that moment, the grace of God flowed through me. And healing took place. Restoration took place. She said, thank you, God, for forgiving me. And thank you for forgiving this man as well. Let God remove your grudges as his grace works within you. The Grimm brothers wrote a number of fairy tales. One is about a uh, frog prince, a young man, probably a little bit uh, uh, egotistical, a little bit uh, narcissistic. He was in love with himself, and a wicked witch came along and said, I'll show you, and she turned him into a warty, ugly, slimy, green frog and said, the only way out of this is if a beautiful princess comes along and gives you a kiss. Well, a princess came along, and uh, she saw a warty frog, but in time, she began to see something different in the life of that little animal, that little creature. I don't know the whole story. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But the moral is that she eventually kissed the frog. And he was restored into a handsome prince. Well, we don't have a frog kisser. Maybe we do have a frog kisser. No, we have something more important than a frog kisser. We have a good shepherd who offers us the kiss of his grace to restore the broken places in our life. The kiss of his grace to remove the guilt that we have because of the burden of our sin. The gift of his grace to sustain us and to comfort us in the midst of grief and loss that we have in life. The gift, the kiss of his grace that empowers us to forgive others even as God in Christ has forgiven us. He, the good shepherd, has the ability to restore to restore our souls. So this morning I invite you to bring your hurts, to bring those places where your soul has been torn down. Come to Jesus and by faith let him work a miracle of grace in your life. Let him restore your soul. Let us pray. Lord, as we worship this morning, we thank you for Jesus and his great healing grace that meets every need that we have in life and especially meets these needs of guilt and of grief and of the grudges that we carry. Work a work in grace this morning and those who call out to you in faith asking for your intervention, your help, your deliverance, your restoration. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.